aloha and uh, hola to some of you and hello to others. Uh, great to have you on the panel today. Uh, today we're going to be covering uh, island resiliency and talking about energy storage systems and different methodologies of how we finance them to help our island nations be much, much more resilient than uh, what they are today. And boy, do we ever have an action-packed group of people today on this panel. It's actually quite impressive. But I thought, before I get into all the introductions, you guys can kind of hear the DNA. And so, uh, Sandra, Quack, Sandra, do you, you've got a little ukulele or something there. Would you mind just opening this thing up with the sounds of the island? Go for it, sis. Sure thing. climate change because every little thing is gonna be all right if we invest in renewable energy don't worry about a thing because every little thing is gonna be all right yes oh that was fantastic thank you so much for doing that isn't that a great way to start uh to start a panel i think in the what we need to do is every time we speak on a panel, you just come with us, okay? Let's just do this thing. So that was, that was, <laughs> All right, my pleasure. <laughs> that was beautiful. Excellent. Well, hey, again, aloha. and just want to welcome everybody here uh, to the panel today. Just some uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, we're going to be running a poll uh, here today. Talk in, in, so the poll allows us to learn a little bit more about you. Uh, hey, where are you from? And uh, what sector... Uh, it best describes you. So please click those in there. It would be awesome to have it there. Look at that. I got people saying aloha, hola. I love this. Hey, PJ, good to, good to see you guys. So what a blessing it is. So this panel today, it brings together stakeholders from Hawaii. Uh, we have folks from Puerto Rico, uh, and we're going to discuss the efforts to create a cleaner and more resilient electrical systems. Uh, both, both regions face considerable threats from natural hazards with Puerto Rico, as many of you know, still recovering from the devastating uh, impacts of Hurricane Maria. And so this, this discussion is going to bring together all the stakeholders and to share how these different islands, how they're prepping and preparing and uh, designing uh, energy systems and electrical systems for the future to be a bit more resilient. And so to start off, I'll just introduce myself really quick. My name is Greg Murphy. I'm the moderator today. Um, I've been in the uh, renewable energy since the mid 90s, started in off grid uh, energy storage and have just been having a blast since then. So, uh, but you don't want to hear about me. We want to really talk to these uh, experts we have on the panel today, which I'm, I'm really excited about. So uh, the first one there, oh, I'm starting to see the poll come through. Look at that. We got about 48% of the people from the Caribbean. Please, on these polls, check in there uh, as well. And then also, um, on the bottom, we have a question and answer. So the things that are going to be discussed today, uh, you guys are going to love it. And so please, on that question and answer, type in your questions uh, for the panel or maybe just questions you have that you would like to, us to answer. Uh, and we will jump right on those as well. So uh, please uh, take advantage of that as much as you possibly can. We'll be looking at the chat window there as well. But today we're going to be talking uh, 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 Christopher Johnson. Christopher is the COO of Blue Planet Energy, and he's led the team's expansion and, and smooth growth of the company. Uh, for over 20 years, Christopher's built an extensive background in both science and sustainability which fuels his passions to lead teams to create positive impact in the world. Christopher has been recognized as a titan of tech by the public PBN uh, and the Thomas uh, J. Watson Fellow and a Global Social Benefit Accelerator Fellow at the Miller Center. All around rock star that guy is. So uh, what Christopher is going to talk with us here in a second. And then uh, we also have Sandra Kwok. Now, Sandra is gifted with incredible musical talent and just she just exudes aloha. And so Sandra is the founder and CEO of Ten Power, an organization that works together with local partners to develop and finance commercial scale solar projects in Haiti, making renewable energy affordable and accessible uh, for tangible improvements in livelihood and prosperity. 
She has previously served as COO and president of PowerZoa and scaled AutoGrid from prototype to a global brand. So when I said rock star, you know what I mean. So I can, we get really stoked to hear from her. And then uh, also on the panel is Gabriel Perez. And so Gabriel Perez, uh, or Gabby as we call him, is he's the, he, he runs operations and sales there in Puerto Rico for Blue Planet Energy. He's a native to the island of Puerto Rico. And Gabby has experienced the disaster of Hurricane Maria and all the recovery efforts. He was on the ground. He's really been pivotal in making the transition of that island. And so you're going to have great news from him. Uh, and he's played, again, a, a major role in building the island with his charisma, leadership, and knowledge. He also serves on Acon Air uh, there uh, as well. So it's great to have him. And I want to wrap this thing up with Justin Locke. Uh, if you guys haven't met him, get ready. You're about ready to meet just a guy who's just also a titan in the industry here. Justin Locke is the senior director at Rocky Mountain Institute. And RMI is Empowering Clean Economies Program. That's what he does. And, uh, and he's also the senior lead for the Islands Energy Program. He's previously held the position of Infrastructure Disaster Risk Management Specialist at the World Bank, where he managed the Caribbean Adaptation and Infrastructure Portfolio. So I would say with the people we have on this, ta on this task force are well equipped to talk about what's happening in the islands and the innovation that is yet to come. So, uh, so before we jump into it, Chris, I want you to get ready. Christopher is going to share a little bit, do an introduction into, uh, uh, into what he's doing with Blue Planet Energy and then Sandra and Gabby as well. And if you guys have questions about things they're saying, please use that question and answer form there. And also on the polls, please jump on the polls so we know a little bit about who you are. Uh, where you're from, and also what, what sector you're from that best describes you from academia, are you from the utility, NGO, other, uh, you can make something up, but it'd be great to know who we're talking to and who's on the panel here today. But uh, Christopher, brother, are you ready to jump in there and share a bit about what's going on Blue Planet Energy? I am, Greb. Thank you. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. We like to get a little bit of the visuals as well. Thank you everybody for uh, joining us today and thank you James and your team for putting together this awesome event and for having us here. Um, and as, as Greg said, I'm with uh, Blue Planet Energy. We are a Hawaii based company and, uh, and we have been put on a path, um, a, a mission from our founder to end the use of carbon based fuels. That's a big mission and, and Hank, um, who you see here shaking hands with the governor of Hawaii um, is really a big picture and a big thinker. And so um, Hawaii uh, faces some of the same issues that, that many island communities have in the sense that we, um, Hawaii has the most expensive electricity in the U.S. And, and also abundant renewable resources, plenty of sunshine. And so it's a great place to be able to launch into renewable energies. And, and Hank started uh, the Blue Planet Foundation, um, totally separate entity from Blue Planet Energy, but of course we share that mission. Um, uh, over 10 years ago to, to put in place uh, uh, policies to uh, support uh, renewable energy. And so that got Hawaii to be the first state to commit to 100% clean energy by 2045. And they really thought about it from the perspective of um, Hawaii is in the middle of the ocean, a uh, long way from everywhere, and, and most of the electricity is coming by burning fossil fuels. 70% um, is just from burning oil. And that oil all has to be brought in by boat. It's very expensive. And that leads to some of our, you know, those expensive electricity costs. And in the process of having such an expensive electricity, it actually holds back the economic growth and opportunities in the islands as well. And so it seems like a perfect opportunity. Okay, let's figure this out. We don't have to worry about the complexity of large grids like California and all the interconnections that are happening with other states. We're literally islands. They're totally islanded. Let's figure this out here and figure out how to replicate this in other places. And so Hank put us on this, uh, uh, Hank really put us on this path both on the policy front, but also in, in founding the company. Um, and, uh, oops, sorry, there we go. So Hawaii actually has a fairly um, uh, similar uh, energy source mix to Puerto Rico, which is another place we do 
uh, a lot of our work. Um, you know, but but for all of that oil that's brought into the state, we export over 1.3 billion dollars every year. That's just money flowing out of the economy, not providing any local benefit. And um, some of the uh, work that's been done in, in looking at the policies around this renewable energy uh, mandate that we have to hit 100% clean energy by 2045, um, there was a study that was done uh, to look at, okay, well, the policy says that we should accelerate our adoption. So we, you know, so you can see this blue curve here on the right, um, which sort of says, okay, we're going to do more adoption towards the end. But what the study found was that we could actually save $7 billion in this process if we adopt faster. And that's because uh, a lot of the technologies are readily available to get us further along this curve of getting to renewable energy faster. And so, uh, so now we're pushing for how can we do this even faster? Now, one of the things that we, we see in renewable energy is it's not just enough to think about renewables, putting more solar. Solar is, you know, I think that some of the, the easy things for us to point to as a, uh, as a solution here. Um, and, you know, what, what we saw in, in when we were initially working in Puerto Rico, and Gabby will talk some more about this as well, is there was 10,000 rooftop solar installations in Puerto Rico when Hurricane Maria hit. But when the grid went down, none of those solar systems were producing any electricity. So we also need to in introduce not just renewables, but also resilience. And so, um, so across the planet, we're seeing the need to replace fossil fuels. This is an opportunity for our local economic development and empowerment. Um, energy storage, which is what Blue Planet Energy is dedicated to, is, is a way that you can stabilize those renewable resources. And it provides both climate adaptation as well as climate mitigation. So enabling more renewables to be adopted and creating resilience. So and in, in several areas, we also see grid breakdown. Um, yeah, I'm actually calling in from California today where the uh, PG&E, the largest utility in the state, is shutting down power to over a million and a half people today. And we don't know when they'll be turning it back on. So the grid is actually having challenges and it's very expensive to invest in, in that grid. And so actually distributed energy resources, which renewables uh, with energy storage represent, can be cheaper solutions. Uh, we also see uh, climate events causing the need for um, additional uh, uh, resilience and especially for our critical in infrastructure. And we're also seeing in the islands, uh, island nations that we're working in, a lot of these generator based grids have incredibly high costs of energy. And so renewables can, you know, can, can provide a, an excellent opportunity to replace those dependence on foreign oil as well as to um, uh, uh, lower cost of living. So one of the things that we like to provide some education about as well is people think about, okay, great, batteries. Um, uh, and, and, and people think about the cost curve that solar has and solar's come down dramatically in price over the years. Um, but that's, that cost curve for solar is about, is about 40 years in the making. Um, lithium ion batteries are actually fairly new and, and they're only about a decade into that, that cost curve. So they are coming down in price, but we run the risk of sacrificing safety for this chasing the lowest cost uh, in the market. And so we look to um, markets like South Korea, where there has been large uh, government incentives for adoption of, of energy storage. And, and um, they're actually starting to experience a large amount of fires um, from it at the batteries causing millions of dollars of loss. And this has led to the actual um, having to shut down the battery operations at many of these sites. And so, um, you know, so important thing to think about with the batteries, I'm sure everybody's heard about the, the, the Samsung notes that you can't take on airplanes or the hoverboards uh, that were catching on fire. That's kind of got some of the same elements that are, um, that are causing challenges um, that we're seeing in these fires in, in Korea. And so when you see cobalt or nickel in those batteries, those are um, potentially dangerous chemicals that have the properties that can lead to thermal runaway in batteries. So when we think about resilience, we don't want the batteries to be part of a problem, right? Because we're, we're, when resilience is really, especially energy resilience, is the ability to prepare for and also to recover from disruptions that we have. And so um, that can be natural or uh, uh, natural disasters or um, cyber attacks or any of those things. So when we look at this, and you'll see here on the, on the, uh, 
the right, the photo from an installation um, where we've got a system that can completely island itself from the grid. This is actually a grid tied system. And so I love that we're in our island summit here um, and we get to talk about energy systems that can island themselves. That's how we explain microgrids. Um, but essentially you create your own little independent energy universe. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is a key piece that we're seeing that um, even today, two years after you know, we've started work in Puerto Rico, many of critical infrastructure places don't have that resilience. Um, and today in, in California, we're gonna see really the impact of that um, uh, uh, being uh, really behind in adoption, even in one of the, the, the richest economies in, in the US. So our company is a mission-driven company and we're, we set out to make the most durable, safest and scalable energy storage system. Um, and we have been focused on microgrids uh, for critical infrastructure because we can provide both the resilience and the renewable energy. So we think that pull, brings us along our mission of, of delivering, uh, 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 of reducing our dependence on fossil fuel. Um, and hopefully what you experience with, with our team uh, is that culture of aloha. And we'd like to say that both our products and our team are powered by aloha. Um, so just a quick uh, glimpse of, uh, uh, of our product, and then I'll pass it back to Greg to continue on our conversation here. So our Blue Ion is our, our brand of our product. This is our Blue Ion 2.0. It's been in the market for uh, almost three years now, um, which is built on a chemistry of uh, iron phosphate. So lithium iron phosphate um, it does not have the risk of thermal runaway or the fires or explosions that you see in some of the, nickel, the NMC uh, chemistries. Um, is a very and, and partially that's because the chemistry is very robust, uh, which gives us a long lifetime. So we can provide a 15-year performance warranty on this system. It also means you can use these uh, batteries very intensely. So drain them down 100% and charge them back up 100% every day. And so that's one reason we've had such success starting with the off-grid markets and remote uh, and grid edge markets is that uh, customers want something that lasts a long time. You're not going to damage the battery if you over discharge it a little bit. Um, and, and is also safe. Uh, so, um, so we are proud of this work and the work we've done, and I hope you get to see some more of that uh, uh, from some of the other stories we share, and I'd be happy to answer any of the questions coming up. And uh, again, thank you all for your participation today. Fantastic, Chris. All right, Greg. Yeah, fantastic, Back my friend. Well done, well done. That's uh, really interesting to see that you've got island nations helping other island nations. It's a beautiful thing seeing Hawaii pouring out into places like Puerto Rico and other places like that. So, so wonderful things. Hey, by the way, if Christopher, uh, if you have questions for Christopher specifically that you'd like him to address and to talk more about, jump down there on the question and answer uh, tab and go ahead and type in your questions and we'll go ahead and, and uh, uh, answer those as best we can there. So bring those in. And just seeing people from all over the place here on different islands, guys, thank you for your chatting and keeping things moving ahead here. I want to introduce uh, our next speaker here with Sandra. So again, Sandra, you've heard, I've already introduced you a bit, but would you, your voice, your singing, it's amazing. Jump in there. Tell us a bit about what you do, who you are, and what your heart is for the island nations. Go for it. Thanks, Greg. So my company is called 10 Power, and we are working in Haiti. Um, which is the first market that, um, that we've chosen to tackle. The mission of 10 Power is to bring renewable energy to places that don't have access to electricity today. And so we are working on commercial and industrial scale solar um, right now, bringing finance and project development to help get projects off the ground and create clean energy economies in places with high energy poverty. All right, can you all see my slides here? Excellent. So 10 Power's mission is threefold. We bring project development, so expertise in international codes and standards and engineering expertise for capacity building. Um, we also source finance for projects and we work very directly with local installers and help create local ecosystems with training programs. Energy, as all of us know, is basically the key to creating improvements in livelihoods and prosperity from having access to clean drinking water to access to global markets, gender empowerment, education, it touches our lives in every single way. It's, um, it's what's powering all of us to be here today in this amazing virtual summit 
not having to expend carbon dioxide emissions on flights um, to have this wonderful convening. So um, as you think about how solar and renewable energy can lift billions of lives across the planet, um, 10 Power is, is really focused not just on energy, but also on the productive uses of that energy and making sure that it's integrated in a regenerative way into the community to help lift all boats. So the case in Haiti is probably very similar to the case on a lot of islands where there's an unreliable utility. And so all businesses have to use diesel generators. In Haiti, there are blackouts every single day. And depending on how far away you are from Port-au-Prince, sometimes you can go days or weeks at a time without electricity, which um, I'm here in California right now, which may be um, kind of the up and coming situation for California as well. Um, so these diesel generators, um, similar to the situation that Chris described in, in Hawaii and probably similar to a lot of situations that you've seen on island nations, um, all of that diesel is imported and, um, and it's very costly. The price of electricity drives up the cost of everything else. And it's not only the price of diesel, it's also the operations and maintenance on the diesel generator. And then of course there's the societal costs of the emissions that are going into the atmosphere, both direct health, um, health impacts on lung health, asthma, um, links to lung cancer, as well as the larger global issue of climate change, which is especially impacting people on the front lines and uh, most drastically impacting those who had the least to do with creating the conditions for climate change. Now, Haiti has um, a, a potential massive market for renewable energy. There is both high return on investment as well as high social return on investment, SROI. Um, my father is from South Korea, and when he was a little boy, South Korea was one of the poorest countries on the entire planet. And if you look at South Korea today, they're a global brand leader. They're, they have major companies like Samsung, largest shipbuilding port in the world, and they're also investing in a lot of green infrastructure. So I see the potential for places like Haiti, which is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere and the seventh poorest country on the planet, to really within one generation, similar to what South Korea did, become a world leader in renewable energy, in regenerative best practices. And I see this potential for, for a lot of fringe um, and emerging economies across the world. So 10 Power is currently specced the size of the commercial and industrial solar market in Haiti at 675 million. We have in our pipeline of interested customers over 100 million in potential sales. And it's not just about the sales, of course, it's about preserving the amazing environment that Haiti has, the mountains, the beaches, and also empowering every single individual and enabling them to reach their highest potential. Now, many of y'all have probably seen in the news that Haiti is under extreme pressure right now. There is a great deal of political and economic instability going on. And when you look at the reliance that the Haitian economy has had on imported fossil fuels and the reliance that all of our economies, that the global economy has on fossil fuels in general, Haiti is kind of like the canary in the mine shaft. This is what happens when your entire economy is completely reliant on fossil fuels. Um, basically since the collapse of Petro Caribe, where Venezuela was providing subsidized um, energy to the Caribbean region. Um, when that subsidy went away, Haiti's government took on the subsidy. And so what we've seen is that international lenders have told the government that they can no longer provide the subsidy, that they need to raise oil prices to the market rates. And the population cannot bear it because so many people are already living below the poverty line. The majority of the population lives on less than $2.40 per day. Energy increases the price of everything. And so really the population is at a breaking point. Every time the government has tried to raise the price of fuel, there have been massive protests. There has been investigations into Petro Caribe corruption. And now the entire country is calling for the removal of the president and the administration. And so, so in this case, it's crucial for us to build a renewable energy market. Solar can really solve a lot of these problems by reducing the reliance on imported fossil fuels while simultaneously strengthening Haiti's local economy and businesses and their ability to create jobs. But the question is, how do you scale in a, in a market that's so high risk? And I really see it as the job of both development banks as well as potentially philanthropic capital. So 10 Power is creating a market mechanism for philanthropic donors to be able to put money into for-profit social impact enterprises to be able to create a pool of concessionary capital to help underwrite this risk. And I'm happy to get into that more if there are questions about it. 
We recently completed a project on UNICEF Haiti's headquarters. This was a 130 kilowatt energy storage and solar combination project. This is actually the largest solar installation on any UNICEF base in the entire world. So a reason for celebration. And this fits in with my belief of fourth world nation building, which I have a TED talk on, which is that places like Haiti can really lead the way because we don't already have all of this entrenched infrastructure that we have to retrofit there. Haiti can take the best of breed technologies and implement them immediately. And so, so hopefully in five or 10 years, we'll see the places that maybe today were considered the least developed, really leading the charge in terms of renewable energy innovation. So this UNICEF project fits in with multiple UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are really core to 10 Powers activities. Um, I'll highlight a few, namely no poverty, gender equality, renewable energy access for all, and climate change are what we're working on. And um, the global goals are really a great framework um, from both an impact perspective um, and charting your impact as well as an impact investing perspective. With the UNICEF program, we launched a training um, for women solar installers in partnership with Haiti Tech University, which is one of the leading technical universities in Haiti. We're working on capacity building, so all of the solar installers on our teams are trained in OSHA safety, and we make sure that they're improving their capacity um, for solar installation engineering. And it's our larger goal to build a clean energy economy in Haiti and bring this model to other places across the world that are suffering from energy poverty today. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, for that Sandra. And a, a question came in that I uh, wanted to ask you. So fourth, the, you talk about fourth world. What, can you share a little bit more what you mean by that? Sure thing. So I think we're actually doing development backwards. So we have this false duality between developed and developing countries, first world and third world countries. But if all 7.8 billion humans that live on the planet today had an American's, a US citizen's footprint, then we would need five to eight planet Earths, which just simply is not feasible from a resource perspective. And so what I think we should be doing is doing development the other way, just like tech, which goes 3.0, 4.0, 5.0. So maybe it's the countries that we today consider third world or least developed countries that will be leading the charge in becoming fourth world countries and fifth world countries. And there's actually a World Economic Forum paper that was published um, two years ago called, um, called the Fifth Industrial Revolution, which speaks to data informatics, um, machine learning, big data, renewable energy. And, um, and basically, if we can have a combination of these cutting edge technologies um, and we use those to improve quality of life, but we're doing so powered by renewable energy with buildings that generate food and excess oxygen, where we're creating pathways to prosperity for, for everyone beyond LeapFrog. So, so LeapFrog connotes that, that we're on this trajectory where first you exploit your human resources, then you exploit your natural resources, then you pave over everything. Everybody has a, a house with two garages, three cars, you know, and, and lives in the suburbs then you can start to care about carbon dioxide emissions. And going from A to C or A to D along that trajectory is just leading to the same exact problems that we are already living in. So, so I see this as quantum development. Instead of, instead of going from A to C, let's go from A to theta times 9,000 in a completely new trajectory for human evolution. And I, think, I really think that frontline communities are going to be the ones who are leading this charge and who are going to be quickly adopting existing innovations and creating new innovations that all of a sudden U.S. utilities are going to wake up five years from now and say, hey, what is, what is Curacao doing? What is Hawaii doing? What is Haiti doing? What are the Philippines doing? And bring those innovations back to figure out how to deal with all of these renewable energy distributed nodes. And, um, and so that's what fourth world and fifth world development is all about. Fantastic. That's that great, great insight uh, to that as well. Chris Medley also mentioned that you, is you're connecting on LeapFrog. He said how that is such a key component to exponential uh, growth in technology. Can you speak on that a little bit more of how that will uh, help there? Yeah, so, so I really, from, from, a, from a human development perspective, I, I think that we are, are basically cheating ourselves if we're not providing electricity to every single person on the planet. You know, because the, the next 
Albert Einstein or Steve Jobs could be a little girl at the end of a dirt road who today doesn't have access to electricity and has to carry water on her head for five hours per day. And, and so in innovating our way out of climate change, if we are providing access to electricity and the mother brain of humanity, the internet, where everyone can download information and upload information, and, and these, these kids who are the future geniuses, you know, inventors, all have access to the same resources that, that we get to enjoy in, in places like California, then, then I think that we're really going to see the innovation on a rapid scale that we need to, to invent our way out of climate change. And um, I'll put a link to, to my TED talk in the chat if people are interested. Please, yeah, please do. Uh, it's a very uh, valuable uh, talk there. So appreciate that, Sandra. And, and I've got a couple other questions, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold those um, so that we can get through some of the other uh, conversations, but people are wondering how, how are we going to deal with financing in Haiti and all these things. But before we jump into that center, I want to just say uh, mahalo nui loa for sharing that. And I want to jump now into uh, Gabby or Perez. Gabby, my brother, share with us what you see. What what was Puerto Rico like before Hurricane Maria? Maria, what's it like now? And kind of your vision on what you're seeing happening there, brother. Go for it. Well, thank you, Greg, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this sensational panel. So I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico. I'm a native from Puerto Rico. For the people that don't know, Puerto Rico is a small island in the Caribbean. We're neighbors of Haiti, Dominican Republic, Cuba, and the Virgin Islands. Uh, we're part of the U.S., but we're not a statehood. So it's a lot of people think that, that we're a state, and, and we're, we're part of them, but we're, we're really are independent part of part of the U.S. So just to give a briefing on Puerto Rico, uh, before the hurricane, Puerto Rico has been passing a tough economic crisis. We're talking about we have been in, in a depression, economic depression since 2008, uh, due to and we're currently right now Puerto Rico right now it, it's in the federal courthouse uh, in bankruptcy. Also the utility, the public utility, the only one that we have it's also bankrupt, it's called PREPA. So we have been tough times in, in, <clears throat> in, in workforce part, in the economic part. Uh, a lot of people have uh, gone up the island even before the hurricane uh, looking for other opportunities in the US. Uh, I currently have two brothers of mine that have moved to the US to, to find uh, more stability and, and work. So <clears throat> then the hurricane hit us two years, it's two years and a month now, uh, Hurricane Maria hit us, and, and we were hit by Hurricane Maria, and then we had uh, we, we were prior we had another hurricane. So that hurricane category four hit us. Really, we were not prepared. You know, we're talking about an island that is bankrupt. The infrastructure is has not been stable, and it just crushed the island. Uh, it crushed the island, and and personally, uh, a human humanitarian crisis. I live that. Uh, we didn't have water, we didn't have uh, power, internet. Uh, it was difficult to get the gas stations. We were talking about five hours to 10 hours lines to get uh, gasoline. Uh, I even didn't saw my mother for three weeks. I didn't even knew if she was alive. So it was very tough uh, for us in the island during that period. <clears throat> uh, but from, from bad things, good things happen. Uh, the island, uh, especially the non-for-profits and the communities have joined in and have re rise and they're looking for options to, to be better and, and to next time be, to be prepared, okay? So a couple of things that happened uh, and non-for-profits, uh, here you can see a picture of, of the hurricane on the right side, you can see how flooded was uh, the island and the left you can see uh, before. And then I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna start talking about different projects that we have been working on due to the to the to the hurricane. So a lot of non for profits uh, have been involved directly to the project. We're talking about uh, direct relief, Rocky Mountain Institute, Water Mission, Red Cross came to the island and 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 they have never been involved in solar projects. That's a that's a new thing. Uh, before, like like Chris mentioned. Here in Puerto Rico, we have we already have a mature market in renewable energy. Uh, we're talking about a 10-year market, and we have regulation. But before, everybody has been having grid-type systems. 
with nobody had batteries. So as Chris mentioned, when the hurricane hit, no power. So we had all these solar systems installed in the roof and we were not using them. And we didn't have knowledge on the uh, batteries. We're just starting here. We didn't have a lot of knowledge in, in that matter, but then we started having training and Blue Planet supporting a, a lot of that in, in training the workforce, uh, supporting the women, getting women into, into the industry. But here you can see different kinds of projects. Uh, one of the, the most, uh, I think most emblematic projects is on the water part. Uh, here in Puerto Rico, <clears throat> a lot of communities that are not connected to the water utility company uh, have an independent system that is, that is run by the utility uh, power, but if there's no power, there's gonna be no water. So what happened is estoporosis, a disease started happening in the middle of the island uh, due to people starting to taking showers, cleaning their clothes in, in the water streams and that caused a lot of death uh, in the island. So what, what we have been doing here, especially it's we're putting solar and batteries to this uh, non-process, as we call it, non-process uh, water uh, projects. So those communities will have water 24 seven. And, and, and when we're talking about resiliency, it's not, we're just not putting solar panels and batteries. In some cases, we could use a, a generator because our system can be charged by a generator. So it's a resilience is that if, if there's a, some problem with the battery or solar panel, then we have a, a backup. So that's, that's part of the, the work that we're doing. Other things that we have been doing it's uh, with the banks, uh, when they didn't have any power, there was no ATM function. So we didn't have able to, to have cash to buy food, the little food that we had in supermarkets was just to buy the gas. So the banks are now getting ready and they're putting batteries and solar on all their major banks. So if another hurricane comes, they will have power and people can, can take out money. So that's another important thing that it's, that it's happening here. And another type of project that we have been working on, you can see on the right is with Red Cross. What we're doing is we're powering schools that were used before as refuge. Uh, during the hurricane, and we're building two microgrids, uh, one to the refuge area and one to the cafeteria, okay? And also we're inquiring uh, some uh, generators also in some sense. So if another hurricane comes, those uh, refuge areas will be prepared. Here the refuge areas were not working at all, the generators were not working, so people were leaving their homes to a refuge area and, and probably sometimes they were, it was worse they being their homes. So, so those are the types of projects that, that have been happening. Uh, an important thing to mention here is that due to this storm, uh, a lot of public policy and legislation have come to place. And this is very important uh, to address this. Uh, a new law, Law 17, got signed uh, where we, it's mandating Puerto Rico to be 100% renewable energy by 2050. And currently, as it right now, there has been a lot of process. Uh, right now, there's a microgrid new, new regulation coming into place uh, to do uh, privately owned or, or do off-grid microgrids uh, on, on commercial buildings. Also, the REX market the renewable energy credits regulation, it's, it's, it's right now, it's in a working process. Uh, the new, a new interconnection agreement, it's coming to place. Uh, also energy efficient incentives, they're trying to put in energy efficiency incentives to, to incentivize people to be more energy efficient, put renewable energy. So those things have been helping out uh, the public policy is gonna support us and, and it's gonna jumpstart also the renewable energy industry and support the economy. That's super important. We have been suffering with, with lo job losses for a long time. And it's very important to mention that. Uh, I'm gonna, I, I wanna address uh, one last thing is that here in Puerto Rico, uh, people are rising. You know, people are, uh, you know, are very, there's a lot of things that cooperative movement is into place. 
uh, communities are are working working together. They're educating themselves. They wanna they wanna succeed. Uh, but also uh, there's some you know also there's a bad thing here. You know we have been you know there's people that we have been suffering a mental illness. Uh, have, we have been seeing a lot of suicides, uh, a lot of situation, a lot of people leaving the island. So we're trying to to support. Uh, you know, and being involved with NGOs, not just with the energy part. You know, uh, there has been resiliency on food resiliency. Agricultures are are you know preparing themselves. Uh, hospitals, uh, hospitals, they're putting solar and batteries. Schools, banks, uh, community centers. So, from something bad, something good is happening. And I'm very excited to be part of this uh, and be part of the company. Here, here's other pictures of, of products that we have been working on uh, with our partners, with the NGOs. And personally, NGOs have been the pillar for, for what's going on in Puerto Rico. Uh, the government, we're, we're waiting, we're still waiting for funding that, it's, uh, that they have been mentioning uh, for a long time. We have not received nothing yet. Uh, supposedly, we're going to start receiving some funding for projects. We're talking about the first quarter of next year, but it's very important to to you know to mention again, non for pro If it was not for the non for profits, probably I will not be talking to you right now. Uh, so I'm very grateful for the non for profits to support us uh, to be part of what's happening in the communities. The communities have been a, a you know very inspirational. So that's in general what's going on in Puerto Rico. I don't know if there's other pictures here of, of what we're doing, the microgrids uh, and with Red Cross in, in a, over 140 schools. You can see some pictures where we're installing our, our systems and we're adding generators in, in some schools. So I don't know, Greg, if, if there's any questions. Uh, here's another project. This is Vieques Island with Mercy Corp. This is a cancer facility center where they do dialysis, and and that project uh, has been installed. Currently in Puerto Rico, the the grid it's on a stable. Uh, last week there was no power in my home, and I live near the tourist area, so we're in a working process. Uh, but I'm seeing I'm seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. It has not been easy, but we're very positive and grateful of of what NGOs are are doing here. Excellent. Gabby, uh, brother, thank you for that that insight and and to just echo your point, the value and the power that the nonprofits exhibited uh, during uh, the rebuilding uh, of in, and also the disaster response there in Puerto Rico has been just uh, unparalleled. Anything I've ever seen in my life, where governments were tied by bureaucracy. You had groups like Rocky Mountain Institute, like Direct Relief, Water Mission, Red Cross coming in and just making stuff happen. And so it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a testimony uh, to, to, to for sure to see a great thing happen. Gabby, one quick question. It's, yes. can you just really quick, just talk about how has this, like, tell me about the DNA of the people of Puerto Rico. How has this affected the way they look at themselves, the, the, their culture? How has that played in the part of the rebuilding process here? I can tell very, very sincere. Well, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican people, Caribbean people are, are fun people, happy. Uh, you know, uh, it's aloha. You know, people of Puerto Rico are, are very fun. Too. That's why I love this island, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna never gonna live here. Uh, but personally, it affected a lot. You know, we're, you know, we 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 suffer a lot during that time. And personally, I can say my experience. The first two or th uh, first week or so, I was one of them that wanted to leave the island. You know, I was, you know, seeing a destruction and, and not seeing nothing uh, and just seeing a humanitarian crisis, uh, psychologically, it, it affected about a lot of people. Uh, thank God that I switched that in my mind and, and what I did is started supporting and use my pickup truck and, and start bringing food and water to communities. But, you know, you're, you're, you're still seeing, I'm seeing a lot of people that are affected and a lot of people that cannot tolerate this and have leave the island. We have lost 
or 30 percent of, of the population but you're seeing another other other people moving to the island people that want to support the island uh, a lot of professionals and we have good incentives also right now there's good incentives uh, so promoting to people and you're seeing also a movement of of man a lot of creativity you know you're seeing new restaurants you're seeing people getting educated people that didn't know about renewable energy now they're they're, they're involved so you're seeing both things but uh, you're seeing more that that people want to to rise and and get better you know that's that's uh, uh, the biggest percentage but of course there's also like you say, a dark side, and 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 you know that's that's an unworking process. Excellent, Gabby. Thank you for thank you for sharing uh, your heart and uh, for the heart of the people in Puerto Rico and uh, for making the best mofongo on the planet, brother. So, <laughs> so great work there. Hey, I wanna I wanna introduce next again uh, Justin Locke uh, from uh, Rocky Mountain Institute, and he's the senior director, again, of Empowering Clean Economies in the program. And these guys have been absolutely pivotal in the work they've been doing in Puerto Rico and in the, and in the, uh, uh, the Caribbean and even the Bahamas. They're just fantastic. So Justin, jump on in there, brother. Share, us, share with us what you're up to. Thanks, Greg. And thanks to James for inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, so I think Rocky Mountain Institute's contribution to islands energy resiliency really starts over 35 years ago in the early 80s. Uh, this is a time when industrialized countries in Europe, North America, elsewhere, were really investing in, in large, very large centralized generating facilities, mostly focused on fossil fuels and coal and nuclear. And at the time, our founder, Amory Levins, really looked at this uh, from a different paradigm and said a, a soft pathway, a decentralized pathway where generation is closer to where uh, customers consume that, that electricity is, and, and is, is powered by renewable energy is not only gonna be a lower cost, but a safer alternative to, to centralized fossil fuels. Uh, and that, that is the original ethos and concept in which Rocky Mountain Institute was founded 35 years ago. Fast forward uh, to 2014 and RMI's engagement in the Caribbean was really around that same premise that the Caribbean has a set of uh, unique ingredients that as a region don't exist anywhere else in the world and that has a very high cost of electricity due primarily to its reliance on, on diesel, imported diesel, which uh, a previous speaker spoke very clearly about, coupled with the fact that it has some of the best renewable energy resources in the world. And those ingredients combined to create the enabling business case for a high penetration renewable energy economy across multiple sectors. And, and really that, that those same set of ingredients don't exist in a collective economy anywhere else in the world. And so RMI's initial engagement um, in, in, the, in the Caribbean in 2014, together with our partners at the Clinton Foundation, was really to, to prove out that business case, demonstrating from a technical, financial, economic, regulatory, uh, utility business model perspective, how the energy transition will actually work in order to replicate that at a continental scale. Uh, so since 2014, RMI has been working with our partners at the Clinton Foundation and Carelec, the Regional Utility Association, around three core pillars to address the, the, the risks and the challenges uh, that are preventing that business case from being realized. And that is through techno-economic inclusive energy planning, essentially providing the techno-economic fact base to decision makers such as governments and utilities so that everyone is speaking from the same hymn sheet. What we found was that governments had their one set of facts and utilities had another set of facts. And, and in order to really make progress on energy transition, you had to chart out the, the techno economics and understand what projects were optimal for a specific jurisdiction. Uh, second, we recognize that there's a lot of risk involved in these projects, in, uh, particularly in the Caribbean, but across the developing world, in terms of political risk, currency risk, off-taker risk. And all these things need to be addressed and can't be addressed by one developer, one uh, by the private sector alone, that it needs organizations like uh, Rocky Mountain Institute to come in and address those risks 
in order to crowd in the in private sector investment. And to date, we've deployed 12 clean energy projects totaling over two, and leveraged over 200 million in private sector investment. Many of these projects were the first renewable energy projects at utility scale in, the, in, in most of the Caribbean countries where we're operating. And finally, we felt that in order for the Caribbean to really realize it's in the energy transition and its vision for the energy transition, it has to work together and it has to learn from each other's uh, successes, but more importantly is each other's failures. So we worked with Carole Carolec, the Regional Utility Association, to create a community of practice that connects utilities across the region to learn from each other as they go through the, the, the energy transition so that it's built from within and not, and not uh, from, from outside. So then fast forward to, to 2017, September of 2017, and we have two, two, two Cat 5 hurricanes hit within two weeks of each other, Irma and Maria. Never, you know, never had happened before. And, and this event did two things. One, it, it, it made us realize at least that if the renewable energy transition is gonna be successful, new renewable energy assets have to be designed to withstand Cat 5 winds. As you move from a centralized uh, 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 generating system to a decentralized system, you, be, you, you increase your exposure to natural hazards, but at the same time, you reduce your risk. Um, but these new assets have to be designed for the new reality. And at that point, we, re we released a report called Solar Under Storm that uh, provided the guidelines and standards that design and to design and construct ground mount, cat uh, ground mount solar PV systems to withstand Cat 5 uh, hurricanes. Um, in addition to that, what it also exposed was that Caribbean countries had followed the industrial world in terms of its energy system architecture with having centralized fossil fuel generation with long transmission distribution lines. And what we found is that this, this architecture is inherently vulnerable to disruption, particularly from, from high wind events like hurricanes. And, and obviously what we saw was devastation, not only in, in the major uh, islands of Puerto Rico, uh, and others, but also in Dominica, B British Virgin Islands, even Turks and Caicos and Bahamas. And we had the opportunity to work uh, particularly with uh, uh, Puerto Rico and British Virgin Islands and looking at what does, a re what does resiliency actually mean in the energy sector? And for the first time really analyzed at each segment of the grid, what is the optimal resiliency measure for an energy system to be more resilient? Um, and obviously the hypothesis was around decentralized renewables would increase resiliency, but we had to prove that out. And so we, we, we did that in, in across several jurisdictions uh, at a time when many, many were just saying underground everything. But what we realized is that um, there's many different options you have for building resilience, in, including microgridding, uh, batter, uh, decentralized segmenting the grid through battery storage, uh, undergrounding obviously is an option as well in urban areas, and even uh, investing in energy efficiency closer to major uh, load centers. Um, so the, in addition to that, what we, what, and I think many of us really uh, uh, discovered during that process was that a, a, an economy is really centered around its services. And when those services, which are mostly grid tied in the Caribbean, lose power, uh, that's when you have economic loss and when you have loss of life, when people can't access these services like water treatment, like uh, health facilities, uh, telecommunications, et cetera. And that grid-tied grid microgrids at these critical facilities that can operate, that also that contribute to a lower cost of electricity for that critical facility during normal times of operation, but can operate independently, detached from the main grid and operate independently during times of disruption is really about how you build resiliency. And so this, this concept around microgrids for critical facilities was really conceptualized and has gained traction across the region, which which Rocky Mountain Institute has deployed in several different jurisdictions. Uh, one caveat, uh, one antidote there is that uh, we were involved in uh, uh, designing, identifying and designing a one megawatt solar car park canopy in Nassau, Bahamas. Um, we constructed, we designed and constructed that to withstand Cat 5 hurricane. Uh, when, when Hurricane Dorian hit the Bahamas, um, although it did not take a direct hit, it took an indirect hit on Nassau, so it did receive Cat 1 tropical storm force winds, NASA lost power while that asset was producing power not only during the storm, but immediately afterwards when the rest of residents lost power. Uh, now, uh, RMI has been mandated and requested by the government of Bahamas and uh, uh, Bahamas Power and Light 
to support them in redesigning the electricity system on the Abaco Islands, in which we plan to take a, my, uh, a critical facilities um, uh, fo emphasis in building out the new generation uh, and the new system architecture from those critical facilities, utilizing renewable energy designed to withstand Cat 5 hurricanes uh, as, 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 uh, as the new electricity system, which we think uh, will be a replicable model, uh, not only for islands around the world, but uh, continental scale as well. Thanks, Greg. Back to you. Wow, that's, that's an impressive piece. I, I re Justin, really uh, appreciate your insights. And we've got uh, quite a few questions uh, that are coming in. And so what I wanna do here and for the rest of the panel um, is, is I wanna open up just pointed a couple questions to you, Justin, that, that people have asked. And then I wanna open it up to the rest of the team there as well uh, to, to go ahead and answer because you, you've all are speaking into this in a pretty direct way. So you mentioned, it's, it's pretty phenomenal, Justin. You talked about a, a Cat5 capable microgrid. Bro, how do you get people to even think about that? How do you <laughs> talk to us yeah. about that? And, and it's interesting. So what we did and to better understand that is actually we analyzed five systems that took a direct hit from Irma and Maria and three that were destroyed and two that survived with minimal damage. Um, to better understand what are the characteristics that require this to, these systems to be built to Cat5. And the main thing was thorough building, which was really is a small premium you have to pay for the increased uh, resiliency of the system, which is essentially increased labor costs that you actually have to put a bolt on the other end when you, when you, throw, when you put the bolt through to, to clamp down these, um, the, 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 the panels. Obviously, you can't prevent debris impact, but you can prevent the lift. And so we outline in uh, our report, Solar Under Storm, which you can download from uh, our, our website, exactly step-by-step step how to design and construct uh, these, new, these systems to withstand Cat5. Again, at a mean, mini, minimal cost premium of 5%, which obviously over the lifetime costs would save you significant amounts of money, given the fact that it's just a matter of time before these systems take a direct hit in the Caribbean region. Absolutely. Great, great, great feedback. And thank you for that on here. And so I want to, uh, uh, Justin, so I want to ask a couple questions. People, uh, I've got Mimi here who's cr created a great question. Uh, and really, I, I've seen the term now come up a couple times, energy sovereignty. I've seen people talk about, is there another way a community uh, owned projects um, that don't have to do with the utility? I've seen off grid thrown out there. Uh, so I want to open this up just to the panel, uh, uh, Justin, if you want to start off in there. So what are you guys seeing? Why is, why is the, the mindset of the islands is shifting away from more of the traditional utility way of doing business? Why are people wanting to shift away from that so much? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, where, regardless of where you're at, I think there's always a, a, an inherent um, tension between the public and the utility. Um, but I do think it's important to understand what your options are and the business models that will enable that enable you to get there. Uh, you have to understand that equity, energy, uh, the equitable benefits of the system are very important, right? And that not only the wealthy that can afford these systems benefit from these new technologies. And so there's really two extreme business models that can be realized. And every island really, depending on the techno-economics of that island, a number of different factors, including the solvency of the utility, uh, you know, you need to determine that and what is optimal and what's the, the optimal mix for a specific geography. But obviously one extreme is that the utility owns everything. They own the, they own the, the solar panels on your roof and they give you the same benefit um, of hosting that asset on your roof through a lease model that, that gives you a, a lower cost of electricity, which also enables the utility to buy in bulk, right? Which lowers the cost of, of the hardware and provides a more equitable di distribution of the benefits, right? Because everyone benefits equally. Uh, the other option is that obviously that everyone generates their own power, right? And, and then the utility may rate-based battery storage where there's a battery storage in, uh, uh, unit in your neighborhood and you buy power, you buy firm power back from that, that, that battery uh, when the sun is not shining, the wind is not blowing, right? At a fixed price. Um, and then there's, then there's the hybrid of things in between and what that looks like. But I think there is no silver bullet here. Um, it's important to understand the economics 
and it's an uh, it's 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 also critical to understand what is equitable for all income spectrums as you look to the, the 21st century grid. Fantastic. Guys, jump on in there. I know there's a couple others that have uh, some comments on this. Jump on in there, panel. Uh, Greg, sorry. Go Gabby. Yeah, <clears throat> my experience here in Puerto Rico and, and uh, with communities, it's very interesting. Like all these non, a lot of these non-for-profit projects uh, like example on the water project that, that we're putting solar and batteries on communities. Uh, we're not just giving away a free system to the community and just, you know, let's see what happens. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, some, it's like Sandra says, we work directly with the community. The community gets involved in the project and the community needs to invest in the project with man hours, build something. So they have passion on the project because this will be theirs. And this system is, is well maintained, can be, you know, you can, they can have it for 30 years, even more. So that's something different from where we are accustomed here in Puerto Rico. The, the government just gives stuff for free and people don't appreciate it. And, and probably that's why uh, they, don't, they don't last long. But the good thing is that communities are engaged in the process and they're getting educated and they're very interested they they already know how uh, how to be without power for months without water they remember that so they don't want to pass that uh, they don't want to suffer again so i think the important thing is to keep doing all the critical facilities in puerto rico and all in the in all islands you know, in Puerto Rico, we, we just saw what happened here two years ago. It could happen to anywhere. You just saw another, a hurricane going to Ireland. That's that Dorian. Like it's it's crazy what's happening in climate change. So so it's very important the communities to get involved and and to be prepared. Uh, that's that's the experience that we're we're seeing here in Puerto Rico, and and I love it. I love I love to see communities that women. You know, that we're working with Bosque Modelo and it's a woman organization where we're training the women and we're getting involved the women. So we're helping them also to, to get jobs. So it's not just that we're building resiliency, creating jobs and we're helping the environment. So it's, it's awesome to, you know, to work in those pillars. And it's amazing how solar jobs are, are long-term jobs. So if you're teaching people to do operations and maintenance, or if you're just working with an already completely competent local subcontractor on operations and maintenance, you're creating long-term <laughs> jobs, unlike fossil fuel extraction or mines projects, you know, where, where it's a short-term job for a certain amount of time, and then people are just left with a devastated environment after that. So, so in terms of ongoing development, helping to train people up in solar is, is really healthy for, for the economy and for, for people's livelihoods. And um, yeah, I, I think it's hypercritical anywhere in the world that you're working that, that you have very strong local partners and, um, and that you're helping to continually improve the capacity of those partners. I saw that there was, um, there was a question um, about if partnerships are necessary. I can speak from the Haiti experience right now. The big missing piece in the Haiti market is financing. And so we see our role as just bringing in the missing components. So anything that already exists in the local market, we, wanna, we want to fortify and help lift up. But anything that doesn't exist, um, especially access to, to financing that makes sense for solar, um, we'll go out there and, and find it internationally and bring it to the market where it can help to, to uplift those local installation partners. Yeah, I think it's great, great points about the, the building that local capabilities uh, and capacity. Um, you know, we, that when we first started working in Puerto Rico, everyone was used to putting on grid tied solar and didn't have experience with batteries or microgrids. And, uh, as, you know, as Gabby mentioned, we, uh, Gabby and part of our technical team have been training uh, uh, around the island for the last almost two years and have reached over a thousand people. Um, that we've uh, built that local capabilities um, with. Um, you know, and someone had asked about, uh, is there utility pushback on these kind of things? And, um, you know, I think where, what, what Gabby mentioned there of the community engagement and participation is absolutely key. And unfortunately, it's, 
um, not all communities are that well organized or have those like uh, community structures and processes to be planning in advance. And I think what unfortunately we're seeing is that it's in response to a disaster or a crisis that people start to actually uh, work on these things. Um, certainly in, in Hawaii, um, you know, the utility fought pretty hard against uh, these 100% clean energy policies. Now they see that it can actually be in their benefit now that they're having to do it. But I think um, uh, both in Hawaii and in California uh, and some of the Northeast of the US, um, progressive legislation and regulation is what gets the utility to change. Um, a, a lot of the utilities are stuck in a very antiquated monopolistic business model, which is not really equipping them with great tools to, to deal with a whole new reality. And so we kind of have to get them to change. Um, but I think uh, we are, you know, but part of what we're doing is showing them that there's ways to do this that can be profitable. And, and as Justin mentioned, there's ways that the utility could actually be doing this. If we get the utilities on board, we could implement this change way faster. Um, but it's, it's hard to enroll their support in something that's so outside of what they even have a mindset for. So it's great that uh, organizations like Rocky Mountain Institute are, are doing the convening and doing the hard work of getting uh, some of that change. Um, I do want to plug one other book from Omri Levins as well, uh, which is called Reinventing Fire, uh, Bold Business Solutions for the New Energy Era. So um, there's a bunch of good content out there. Um, um, but looking at like, how, you know, there's a lot of folks looking at now, how do we pave this way to really be shifting over to renewable energy? And, and, um, and, and it, it's going to take a lot of the, the work on the ground, though, and, and making locally relevant solutions that engage the partners and create well-being locally. Absolutely. We've got in a couple other questions that keep coming in. I, I mean, guys, keep the questions coming in. These are awesome. So as we're, we're looking here and, and we're talking about, first of all, why is there even a need to do this, right? And we're trying to work with the utilities. It's not quite their business model. Uh, in specific, I want to talk about really, if we jump to Haiti really quick, Sandra, you good with that? I want to like get some of your thoughts. Like, what are you seeing there? Like, why it, 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 why isn't the utility taking care of the people? What's, what's the problem? What are you facing there? Well, the utility right now is, um, is bleeding about $200 million per year in, um, in subsidies for imported fossil fuels. So that's, that's one drain on the utility. The other drain is that only about 50% of the electricity generated is actually collected on. So, um, so there's actually a word in Creole for stealing electricity, gombelan. And, um, and so it's difficult for the utility being understaffed, um, not having enough revenues to be able to go out and collect on a lot of the electricity. Um, you'll see crazy stuff, you know, where there's barbed wire hooked up to a pole that's, that's being, you know, strung out for like a half mile um, out to a remote area because people don't have electricity. And so, so they're gonna do whatever it takes um, to be able to, to charge up their phones or get lights for their kids to study. And, um, and so, so the utility Idiash is um, a government owned monopoly. Um, and, and given that it has this, um, this complicated number of problems, um, it's been really challenging for them to upgrade aging infrastructure um, to, to deal with um, you know, a, a lot of the poor power quality. So there's oftentimes some um, extreme voltage spikes that happen um, across the grid. And, um, and so, so what we've seen in the last couple of months is um, that that's been brewing for a few years is a partnership between ADH and the World Bank um, to help promote independently owned renewable energy microgrids. And, um, and so the World Bank um, put out a tender last year. Um, 10 Power is a pre-approved vendor on this tender and, um, and they will be launching another tender for independent Produce power producers to come in and provide renewable energy microgrids for rural residential communities um, with a small subsidy. It's, it's not a large enough subsidy to really make the microgrids um, independently viable. We actually did a, um, a webinar on that a few weeks ago um, on, on what needs to happen still for rural microgrids to, to be a business model um, in places like Haiti. So, so there's still a need for philanthropic and soft concessionary capital to come in, but there is a small subsidy um, that's being distributed through a, um, through a, a Haitian government run entity called Anarse um, in partnership with the World Bank. So hopefully we'll be seeing um, a few more international uh, partners participating in this um, upcoming tender um, because the last, the last tender there were, there were very few submissions for. 
So, um, so yeah, I, I think that there is a role for the utility to play. I hope that the utility of the future sees themselves more as a um, transmission and distribution provider and a data arbiter. Um, especially in places where they've had trouble with creating reliable electricity generation. There's a lot of potential for distributed renewable energy resources that are on in communities, on commercial and industrial facilities. And then the utilities role, if they saw themselves as an energy distributor, would be to connect these different communities to keep tabs on how much electricity is being generated and then potentially to do load balancing and have some grid scale energy storage. Um, so if utilities just shifted the way that they see themselves, then um, there could be a really vital role for them in, in the up and coming ecosystem. Interesting. Interesting. So we're talking a bit about the utility and in, in ways that they could help support this transition. And so, but what I want to do is bring it now back to the people, because at the end of the day, it's the people that are suffering in, 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 in the, these island nations and communities. How in, in the, typically I'm hearing about cost of systems, uh, uh, in, in, in unreliable systems. I'm hearing a bunch of challenges. Can you guys just depend? I want to open this up. Talk to me about the cost of these systems. How are, how are these in so some areas are impoverished, others are not. How do we support our local community here uh, with these system costs? I can jump in on that. Um, fortunately, we've seen a decline year over year in the cost of photovoltaics. So the panels themselves have been coming down in price. And, um, and I'm, I'm really excited to see the traction that Blue Ion is getting because what really needs to happen to unlock the market to, to make standalone renewable energy systems, microgrids, picogrids, nanogrids available to everyone is the cost of energy storage needs to come down. And, um, and so whether that takes more R&D, whether that takes drastically scaling business models, as we see the cost of energy storage um, becoming more attainable to bring the kilowatt hour price down, um, it, it will become more available to, to especially people who are really on the, on the edge fringe communities in these rural remote areas. And, and, and just to add on that, I think from a financial instrument perspective, both at utility scale and at the, at the household residential or commercial level, um, one instrument that could be used, leveraged uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very strategic way is guarantees, right? So at a utility scale, uh, anytime you have an off taker, uh, uh, and, and uh, most, most IPPs actually require in a PPA a sovereign guarantee to backstop a PPA. And most of these countries are, have very little fiscal space to tie up in a, uh, have been backstopping a PPA. And so if we can find an alternative, a, a commercial guarantee that can backstop these PPAs that don't require a sovereign guarantee, you're gonna see the market on the utility scale open up significantly. At the same time, it's, it's the same philosophy uh, uh, with your local banks, right? Is that the, the financing terms are still too high to, for, for uh, widespread adoption uh, because the risks are too high at the, at, the at the residential and commercial level. And if we can find you know, innovative uh, backstops and guarantees to backstop these local banks so that they can lend at a much more competitive interest rate, you're gonna see a significantly higher uptake um, in, in, in some of these loan schemes for both residential and commercial. Yeah, fi financing has been uh, an interesting nut to crack and, and um, we've been working with uh, some of the folks at RMI and some of our other partners to find ways to um, in a way, like how do you de-risk a, a situation that that the you know most of the sources of capital are very con very conservative and very risk averse, and so even looking in Puerto Rico where it's part of the U.S. and and the same laws apply, it can be hard to get the creditors to want to go in with uh, with financing options, and so it's been. Um, uh, and that really, I think, is the key to unlocking greater adoption, um, because especially with these long lasting systems, like Gabby mentioned, they can be 20 to 30 years in operation. If you can pay for it over that time, it can be cheaper than what you're paying for uh, your, your uh, utility bill on a monthly basis. Um, and certainly places where you're paying for uh, diesel fuel that's brought in from far away, you're going to be able to see some savings. If you can get it down to unit economics that you can pay for over time. Um, but it's, uh, uh, I think the, um, there's a lot to do there. And I think finding local partners where you can um, bring in local resources, like, like Justin mentioned, there's various financial tools that you can create a, a, a system around. Um, but really it, it takes some innovation and some pioneers to go in and um, uh, be able to prove that something's possible. 
Um, and, you know, I, a, a, a guy a, a, on my soccer team who, who's gone solar and battery on his house said, you know, the economics were close enough. I know it's the right thing to do. And so there's also a sense of who's going to be the leader in paving this path. And so we're grateful for some of the, um, uh, the nonprofits coming in with, you know, with some of these funds to make things happen. In Hawaii, it's hard for us. You know, we've talked to customers in Hawaii who they've got great solar adoption, but it's been much slower on the, uh, the resilience uh, with the energy storage and those microgrid architectures. And, and the thing is, they haven't been hit with a hurricane for over 30 years on the island. And, and so it's kind of like out of mind. And um, now you see in Puerto Rico, the mindset is everything's going in with batteries and with the, this microgrid setup. Um, but, but it's again, trying to get that urgency, that sense of, okay, we really need to be doing this now and, and, and getting the capital to get off the bench and get in play and get us towards solutions. So we, we need to apply the urgency to those um, uh, policy makers, those uh, financiers and, uh, and the regulators as well. Yeah, to continue on that, um, if, if you look at where utility infrastructure came from, um, a lot of established utility infrastructure, the transmission and distribution lines, um, you know, the, this really expensive long-term payback period infrastructure came from government bonds. And, and these had very low interest rates, like a 1% interest rate over a 50-year payback period. And in markets like Haiti, where there, there is no bond market to draw from, then I think it's really important for other sources of capital to come in. So, so for international development banks, for large scale philanthropies and individual philanthropists, we have seen over, over the past couple of decades, wealth concentrating into the hands of fewer and fewer people. And, and I think it's the responsibility of those people to, to help ensure you know, that, that humanity is protected from climate change, you know, especially those with larger carbon footprints. So, so what, what we're doing right now, um, and this is, uh, this is super new, this is, this is kind of a, an announcement right now, um, 10 Power is launching a donor advised fund for renewable energy access. And what this means is that philanthropic investors can come and give a grant to this donor advised fund. And we're working with impact assets who can turn around that capital and use it for risk underwriting, like Justin was talking about, for riskier projects like microgrids in Haiti. And, um, and the beautiful thing from the grant maker's perspective is that instead of going towards a one-time project, if it's successful, it'll return to the fund. So it's evergreen. So it could have 10, 20, 50 times the impact because it's being used to underwrite more and more projects. And, um, and we want to make this paperwork for the donor advised fund open source so that any type of social impact enterprise can use it. And, um, and we're hoping to create this market mechanism to start unlocking capital um, so that these markets that don't have a lot of available government funding for microgrids can use it to underwrite um, renewable energy projects that are more private sector driven. It's hard for me not to dance when you said that. <laughs> that, is, that is fantastic news, creative ways of trying to work around this challenge so we can make uh, a renewable energy affordable to, to the island nations. And some questions and thoughts that came in, again, back to the panel is, is one is, you know, we're talking earlier, Senator, you were talking about this. Gabby, you were hitting on this too. And even uh, 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 Abaco Island, Justin, you mentioned the cost of people running generators because already the grid is unreliable in a lot of these areas. And it's been that way for a long, long time. And so they're already used to running diesel generators because the grid fails all the time. And, and power is costing them 25 to 60 cents a kilowatt hour. This is insane. We can make power cheaper than that, can't we? Just from renewable resources? I mean, are we there yet? Or give me, some, give me your guys' thoughts on that. But I mean, I can, I can jump in first. I mean, obviously the economics on small scale diesel generators versus renewables is very clear, right? Um, I think it gets more complicated when you get into, you know, base load power and, and larger systems, right? Um, and the need for that, obviously to the point made earlier as battery storage comes down, that's just gonna become more and more affordable. But I think the, the, the main point here is that a, a diesel generator when it's not being used is a sunk cost, right? So that, that's, that's an investment that is not giving you any return, right? Whereas a renewable microgrid, you know, is, is lowering your operating costs, right? When at, at, at all times, right? Because it's, 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 it's lowering the cost of your electricity, coupled with the fact that, you know, when we talk about resiliency, the new future is that power, power is gonna be disrupted. And, uh, you know, as we saw in Puerto Rico, fuel part of that disruption is that that fuel supply is disrupted 
And, and these diesel, you know, these backup diesel systems and these other systems, I mean, they can't get the diesel from the port to the generating plant or to the backup generator. And that's when, you know, you, you get in the danger zone, right? And so uh, having renewables not only, you know, uh, adds to your bottom line during normal times of operation, but from a resiliency perspective, particularly when it's designed appropriately, um, you know, it, it, could, it could be life saving and obviously, um, you know, it, it reduces impact of economic losses during, you know, these major events. <clears throat> Jumping. Yeah, I think we're seeing, uh, Oh, go ahead, Gabby. Oh, it's okay. No, I just uh, wanted to mention, you know, here in Puerto Rico, <laughs> there's a lot of sun. You know, we, we're, we have our climates 24-7. We're summer. So we already have the resource here. And, and, and when we're comparing, like, to the utility, you know, we're, we're buying expensive energy, not reliable, and then when you added that you have not been for months without power, how, how you know, there's it's a non-brainer. Uh, you know, it's a non-brainer to put batteries and, and, and solar. Uh, prices have gone down in panels, uh, in, in batteries, it's gonna come eventually down. And it, it was fun to hear that the Nobel Prize on, on chemistry was given to scientists working on, on ion, uh, Ion technology, the technology that we're working on. So there has been an interest globally on this, and and all eyes have been on on the islands, on what's happening in Puerto Rico, on Hawaii, in Bahamas, and everybody's watching what we're doing. And you know, we just need to replicate the good things that we're doing, and and just keep working. You know, supporting with the NGOs and in the communities. Yeah. In, uh, in, in, uh, after Hawaii, uh, Puerto Rico has the second highest electricity rates in the U.S. And so already, and, and especially now, so we've just um, also released our uh, commercial product, uh, which is um, even though a lot of our existing product is being used in commercial applications, we've made a, a new product that's uh, designed to make that simpler and easier. And in um, uh, designing those projects, we actually model the energy costs for the building. So taking the actual load profile for a building and then modeling it out. And, and we can show return all the time um, with, with these. So if you're in a place where the, the, the energy is expensive or it's poor quality, um, then, then these uh, systems will be able to pay for themselves. And some of our customers have, um, you know, like, like Gabby mentioned, the, the idea of having continuity, um, it, it's kind of hard to put a price on that. Right. Um, you know, we have uh, some commercial customers where the, you know, the loss of productivity for their staff not being able to work because they have high paid engineers and they need access to servers. And if they lose power for half a day, um, the whole system's paid for itself. Um, and so it doesn't take a lot for that, those, you know, to have a return. But I mean, we're even seeing with um, um, and in the energy markets, when you're on the grid, you have both the, you know, the utility would charge both for the kilowatt hours uh, of energy that you consume, as well as the maximum power that you have, or, or sometimes we call like a demand charge or a capacity charge. Um, and so um, uh, solar can help with uh, both of those and batteries can help with both of those as well. And so those are ways that, you know, we, we look at basically being able to do um, cheaper than the um, than the utility can, but the other thing that's happening is these these technologies have gotten so good we can actually provide better quality power than the utility can in many situations. So it's not just a question of cheaper; it's also the quality and the reliability of it. Absolutely. So I, I I'm so sad to say we've only got about seven minutes, and the questions that are coming in are fantastic. Uh, all I got to say, James, we need to do this more often. So I want to just leave uh, a, a couple thoughts here uh, for, for, for the folks. Actually, I don't want to leave them. I want our panel to leave them. And I want you to, if you were to just communicate, if you, uh, you know, each one of you got about a minute, just like what, what, what's your vision, what's your goal? How are we going to fix this problem? So uh, let's start off with Sandra because you just rocked it with the ukulele at the beginning. So sis, jump in there. Give us your one minute, just how are we going to change this world? Thanks. Yeah. The, the question is how, how quick can we do it? We already have the technologies. We already have the business models. 
it's, it's very clear. The places with the highest energy poverty are the places clustered around the equator with the highest solar generation potential. And so it's just a matter of scaling solutions fast enough. As we discussed on the panel, finance is one of the key pieces to unlocking this. Customers can use existing assets. I saw some comments about diesel generators um, in, in the questions. Um, and, and so one of the things that we're doing is utilizing the diesel generator, sometimes for baseload if the customer has a really high baseload, always for failover. Um, so in the case that there's a couple of cloudy days and rainy days in a row, um, utilizing that diesel generator, but adding solar and battery hybrid systems on top of it to make sure that customers can transition. And one of the beautiful things about solar is that it's modular. So you can start out with something that the customer can afford that's equal to or lower what they're currently paying for their diesel generator with financing on a month by month basis. And then you continue to add solar on top of it. You know, if you're building a coal fired or a gas fired plant, you can't add capacity, you know, step by step. So, so the cool thing about solar is it can grow with your business as your business grows or grow with your community as your community grows. So staying in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, making sure that renewable energy is lifting all boats, that it's creating prosperity and regenerative economics and ecosystems for all is really the path to the future. And the big question is how fast can we do this? Let's reverse climate change together. Awesome, awesome. Gabby, jump in there, brother. Hey, Greg, that's simple. You know, uh, do what we're doing here, you know, install batteries, solar in all critical facilities. We have seen what, what happened here in Puerto Rico and, and how this has been helping. So my recommendation is put solar batteries in all hospitals, schools, community centers, banks, uh, be prepared. And not just Puerto Rico, all the islands and engage the community. Community is very important, you know, keep, uh, communities need to get engaged in these projects keep educating themselves. We need more women in the industry. Uh, and also there's, there's an important toolkit. It's called the PRenergyToolkit.com. And my recommendation, that's something that Rocky Mountain and Resilient Power built. That's an important tool where you can, communities can just log in and do their reports. You know, they, they can submit a report if they need what, what type of resiliency they need they need data information. So I suggest to everyone to, to log into the web page. It's with valuable information. Uh, so at the end, it's just keep, you know, keep supporting each other, you know, supporting the NGOs. We need the government involvement, of course, uh, but it has been a little bit difficult to have them involved, but NGOs and communities just, you know, keep working together. Excellent. Gabby, Gabby Perez for president of Puerto Rico 2020. Anyway, uh, Justin, brother, jump in there really quick, man. Why don't you share, sure. share your closing sure. thoughts? Sure. My last little uh, blurb here is that, I, I, you know, I think as we all know very well, islands are really on the front lines of the negative impacts of climate change, right? Dorian just reminded us that um, just, just six weeks ago when, when it hit the Bahamas that these country, that the island countries around the world are highly vulnerable as well as coastal communities. At the same time, they're moving faster than anyone else uh, to create resilient renewable energy systems and, and really demonstrating that change is possible um, and the solutions are there, we just need to scale. So there's an incredible story here around victim to solution provider that, that really, um, and really flipping that script that, that islands are demonstrating, um, you know, that change is possible to the rest of the world and they hold an incredible moral authority um, you know, in the international arena to, to, to drive these solutions at scale. Fantastic. Thank you. Christopher, go for it, brother. All right. So uh, I want to start off by addressing one of the questions that come up there is that uh, seeing is believing. Um, so, uh, and, and asking for some, some live system data here. So uh, I want to show you just real quick from our founder, Hank's house, uh, which has been off grid over uh, five years now. Um, this is the uh, live data off his system. And so you can see he's done over a thousand cycles on the battery, almost 1100 cycles. He's uh, charging up now, Sun, sun's come up in Hawaii and those uh, panels are cranking and filling that battery back up. But you can see his, uh, his usage pattern here being totally off grid. The battery charges up each day and then discharges each night. So that's what it looks like uh, over the week. So. Um, uh, but I want to just comment also on the fact that, like, you know, part of this is it is not a technology challenge here, right? We are looking at political will and, and social uh, uh, organization and mobilization. 
And so what, what um, uh, Puerto Rico has been able to do in becoming uh, now the experts on this, right? Now, now Puerto Rico will have knowledge and, and uh, Puerto Ricans will be out there actually teaching the other islands how to do this. And so I think uh, everyone, my vision is that everyone on this call is now uh, educated and empowered around renewable energy and microgrids and energy storage, and they become activated in their communities and they start to influence and push for change because we need, as Sandra said, how fast can we get this done? We need everybody activated and out there making it happen. Mahalo, Greg. Wow, what a panel, what an awesome time. I'm so encouraged, I'm so, so encouraged. There's goosebumps right there, I'm so encouraged. Guys, so um, uh, appreciate all the insights, the wisdom, please connect with those who are on the panel. Thank you for coming in today, taking your time out of your busy days. Please uh, message us if you have questions about how we can support you in your islands. Everybody on this uh, panel is, uh, that's what we do. And we want to support you, uh, bless you. And again, Mahalo Nui Loa for signing in today. For all of our panelists, I want to just say, Sandra, thank you so much. Justin, Chris, and Gabby, and James, brother, for putting this together. You are a rock star, and we're so grateful that you did this. So, ahui ho, as we say in Hawaii, until we meet again. Bye now. Thanks, everyone.